What exactly is religion? Most of us think we know what it is, but try to define it in a way that completely captures the meaning of this rather strange human phenomenon, and I think you'll find it's not as easy as you hope. That's our subject on Authentic. What exactly does it mean when you call somebody religious? Religion is a word that a lot of people use, and unfortunately, they often do it with a disparaging tone. Even though, if you press them on what it actually means, they'll often flounder because defining it's not a simple task. Precise definitions of religion can be evasive. I mean, just try to define it right now in your head without the help of a dictionary or any other source book, and I think you'll see what I'm talking about. If you're visual, like I am, you, you're probably sifting through a huge variety of mental images, like people sitting in church on Christmas Eve, or a crazy street preacher waving a Bible and shouting down pedestrians, or maybe those crowds of people throwing bright colored powder on each other during the Hindu festival of Holi. But of course, mental images and memories are not exactly a working definition. So, let's suppose for a moment that an alien civilization makes contact with our planet, and you've been put on a representative team for planet Earth, and your job is to help explain how the human race functions. How would you go about explaining the religious impulse that the vast majority of people seem to have? And if you were specifically asked to define religion, how would you do it? Fortunately, a lot of really smart people have already taken a stab at this, which is what you would expect when religion is such a powerful part of the history of humanity. And that means that you and I don't actually have to start from scratch. The American philosopher William James said that religion is, quote, the feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Now, as an immigrant to America, that's a definition that kind of makes me smile because it has distinctly American qualities to it, not the least of which is the focus on individuality. And honestly, I'm a huge fan of American individualism because it has given us a remarkable degree of liberty, especially religious liberty. And this is a freedom that was practically unknown prior to the birth of this nation. I mean, it did exist, and we have a few remarkable examples from time to time, like, say, the Dutch Republic of the 1700s. But you know, over the course of human history in its entirety, this kind of freedom we have right now, it's been really hard to find. Today I live in a place where I'm pretty much free to believe whatever I want without any interference from the state, as long as the exercise of my beliefs does not infringe on the freedom of my neighbors to do the same. I'm not only free to believe what I want, I'm also free to say what I want, at least for the time being. Now, in practice, American religious liberty has been anything but perfect. In fact, go to the history, we've made some pretty big mistakes. But I will say this, as an outsider coming into this country, I really appreciate the freedoms I now enjoy. But let's get back to William James for just a moment. His definition of religion is rooted in individual experience, and he's writing from the perspective of solitude. Now, as a practicing Christian, I'll have to admit that there's something to the idea of individual faith. As you flip through the pages of the Bible, you discover that most of the great luminaries had an individual experience with God before they shared their revelations with the masses. So, for example, you've got Abraham striking out with just his own family to find a new home in the Promised Land. You've got Moses who encounters God at a burning bush out in the wilderness where he's alone. And from that point forward, he experiences God on a one-to-one -one basis as he serves as the leader of the nation. Moses climbs to the top of Sinai alone. He begs God to reveal his glory on the mountain alone. And at the very beginning of the story, back in the Garden of Eden, we have one man and then one couple who experienced the presence of God all by themselves. The Bible gives us an awful lot of individual religious experiences. But I think that you and I both know that personal individual experience is not an adequate definition for religion. 
especially in light of the fact that so many of the world's religions actually emphasize the transcendence of the ego, the vanishing of self, and most of those stress the importance of community. So I'm going to give William James an A for effort because, well, he was a really smart guy. And of course, this is not the only thing he ever said about religion. But as far as a working definition goes, well, that one fails, and we got to keep looking. The Victorian poet Matthew Arnold defined religion as, quote, ethics heightened, enkindled, lit up by feeling. Okay, that's a useful definition because it adds an element that we didn't get from William James, and that's this idea that religion has a body of ethical teachings. I mean, we could give Mr. James credit for saying religion includes the idea of how you relate to the divine, so there is an implication that religion should affect your behavior, but he didn't explicitly say it. Matthew Arnold, though, who happened to be an agnostic, adds the idea that religion does shape the way we interact with the world and each other. It provides a moral code. And we also get the idea that ethical principles, whatever they are, can produce some really powerful emotions. He's recognizing that religious people are often very passionate about their beliefs. But again, I think that falls short because the two definitions we now have would never really give an outsider an accurate or authentic picture of humanity. I mean, people also get passionate about gambling, and there are gamblers who are ethical because they wouldn't consider cheating. And some people have a religious addiction to gambling. But they're hardly the same thing, are they? And again, the idea that religion is a solitary experience doesn't account for the billions of people who find themselves more or less united with others on religious beliefs, and so they form communities and cooperate with each other. And of course, we can always go back to the dictionary, but with a subject this complicated, that's going to be too simplistic. And honestly, really, when I hear a public speaker start a presentation by reciting a dictionary definition, They've already lost me. I mean, if somebody starts by saying, Webster defines such and such as, well, I'm probably tempted to think you didn't do your homework. But for the sake of exercise, let's read the dictionary definition anyway. Dictionary.com defines religion like this. A set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. So there's a little cosmology in there. Especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies. So you get the concept of a god, usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. All right, I'll admit it, that, that wasn't too bad. It includes cosmology, theology, and ethics. But again, if you were to read that to a bunch of outsiders who came to visit this planet, I really doubt they're going to understand unless they happen to be deeply religious themselves. In an old textbook I read many, many moons ago when I was an undergrad, Professor John Hick emphasized the idea that religion is far too complex for a simple understanding. He said that we might have to accept the fact that in order to define the word religion, we might have to resort to a family of definitions. Here's what he wrote. Perhaps a more realistic view is that the word religion does not have a single correct meaning, but that the many different phenomena subsumed under it are related in the way that the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein has characterized as a family resemblance. Now, from there, he allows Mr. Wittgenstein to give us an analogy that really makes sense. But you're going to have to wait until after the break to see what that is. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. When Ludwig Wittgenstein tried to define the word religion, he compared what he was doing to trying to define the word game. Of course, you'd think that explaining what a game is would be really easy because we've all played games and we instinctively know what they are. But then again, most of us are also religious and we instinctively know what religion means. But we still find it hard to explain it fully. Some people might just try to explain that 
A game is something you do for fun, but that's not a full definition because there are people who play games as professionals, like hockey players or even gamblers, and so they're doing it for money, not necessarily for fun. In fact, they have to do it on the days they don't want to. Other people might say a game is a competitive event where people try to better their opponents, but again, that doesn't really explain it because a lot of people consider Sudoku puzzles to be games, and that's something you do alone. Others might say that a game requires a degree of skill, but again, there are games like slot machines that are pretty much 100% random chance. What you really need to do is collect all the characteristics of games and think about them together, and then you might begin to understand what a game is. Now, the same thing holds true if you want to explain religion. You're going to have to experience it and take the time to experience it rather broadly if you want to understand what it is. And when you do that, you might be in for a few interesting surprises. For example, there are secular religions. Religions that do not acknowledge the existence of a supreme being. And personally, I'd be tempted to put Soviet communism in that column. And I know that's not going to sit right with some people because a lot of folks understand communism to be a matter of economics and politics and certainly not religion. Over the last 120 years or so, communist regimes have, for the most part, been officially atheist. But then, if you examine them closely, you're going to find a number of ideas that have a decidedly religious flavor. There are underlying assumptions to the philosophy of Karl Marx, beliefs that you have to accept by faith, like the idea that history is somehow automatically progressing, getting better, moving towards something higher. Marx taught, and he proved to be wrong, but Marx taught that history was necessarily moving everybody toward a communist state, where the means of production could be owned by everybody. But let me ask you a really important question. Why in the world would history be moving toward something better, all on its own? If there is no God, no higher power, then what makes anybody think that a mindless universe would generate moral progress? And let's not forget, more than a hundred million people died at the hands of communist regimes over the 20th century, which strongly suggests that the idea of moral progress was nothing but an illusion. It was a matter of faith, and it was completely wrong-headed on top of that. Now, going back to Professor John Hick, he explains quite nicely how Marxism actually qualifies as a religious belief. He writes, Marxism has its eschatological ideal of the ultimate classless society, its doctrine of predestination through historical necessity, its scriptures, prophets, saints, and martyrs. Thus, we can see it as sharing some of the features of the family of religions while lacking other and probably more central ones. Here's what we know. Most of us, regardless of our religious preferences, still behave in religious ways. Nobody's purely objective. Nobody operates strictly by rational analysis of observable facts. Every single worldview has an element of faith. They all produce people who are passionately committed to a body of opinions and sometimes with religious fervor. So maybe we need to acknowledge that religious belief is a key part of who we are no matter how we practice it. Maybe when the Bible says that all of us have eternity in our hearts, maybe that's a good definition of who we really are. Maybe there's a reason we seek transcendence, and we all seem to have this feeling that something's wrong with our present mode of existence. Almost all of the world's religions seem to feature this idea that we're supposed to be better than we are right now. There's something wrong, they teach. It needs to be fixed. The ancient Greeks blamed the material universe for your problems. You and I are imperfect because we're physical. And their solution was transcendence. The ultimate triumph comes when you die, when your ghost finally disconnects from your body so you can return to a disembodied state. In the Hindu religion, you find a similar concept, the notion of samsara, where, where people pass through a number of bodily incarnations being born over and over and over until they move toward a higher state where they can rejoin the great oneness of the universe. The average human being, they teach, has been greatly deceived about the nature of reality, but we can find salvation by finally learning that we are one and the same as Brahman, the great oneness. In Christianity, of course, we have the idea that human beings have fallen from a state of grace. We've been alienated from our Creator by sin and we need to be restored, brought back to what we used to be. The Apostle Paul describes it like this, and you'll find this in Colossians 
chapter 1. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. The vast majority of human beings realize something has gone wrong in this universe. We're not happy with the idea that pain and suffering are supposed to be a natural part of our existence. And wouldn't you know it, all across the planet, we seem to be deeply religious. Something about our existence on this pale blue dot is really unsatisfying, and we seem to think there must be a solution, there must be a better way to live. From where I sit, religion is the exercise of human beings pursuing that solution. It's a matter of figuring out what we're actually supposed to be and then aspiring to become that. In other words, religion is the practice of finding authenticity, whatever that proves to be. This is why I insist that Marxism can be classified as a religious belief, because it's a secular attempt to solve the same problem. We know something's wrong with human existence, and that was just one more attempt to explain it and fix it. Now, I don't know if you had to read Lord of the Flies when you were in school, but you probably did, because once upon a time, that was required reading. Of course, given the current popularity that censorship seems to be enjoying, I wouldn't be surprised if it was no longer a part of school curricula, but I'm guessing that most of you probably read it. I had to read it in the third grade, if you can imagine, and I've come to believe after reading it that really wasn't written for eight-year-olds. But if you've read it, you might remember it's the story of a group of boys who end up stranded on a deserted island. And the reason this book got a lot of traction was because it's a rather detailed study of basic human nature. It's pure fiction, of course, but there was something about the story that rang a lot of people's bells. It bothered us because Mr. Golding seemed to capture some rather uncomfortable facts about human nature. In the story, a bunch of prepubescent boys attempt to build a civilization of their own because they have to. So they decide on a form of government, and eventually, wouldn't you know it, they also create a religion. They convince themselves there's a dangerous beast living somewhere on the island, and they even start finding evidence that this creature is real. So one of the boys becomes a leader when he promises he can deal with the threat. And for the rest of the story, they build their little civilization around that idea with disastrous consequences. And after I take a little break, we'll enjoy a little bit of reading theater and see if Mr. Golding was on to something. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Okay, we're back from the break, and now it's time to break out a book that I first read back in the third grade. And I seem to remember somebody also showed us the movie before we were 10 years old. Now, to be clear, I'm not condoning sharing this with children because there are ideas in the story that require, well, a little bit of life experience to really understand. I just happen to be one of those kids who read absolutely everything I could get my hands on. In fact, I sometimes had heated arguments with the town librarian because I had an orange library card which restricted me to the children's section, but I was forever trying to sign out books from the green section, which was for adults. But that's all beside the point, because I want to explore one of the central ideas in Mr. Golding's Lord of the Flies. It's the story of some British boys who find themselves stranded on an island, and after a while they develop their own mythology, and their own system of governance, and eventually their own religion. And it's really a bit of a disturbing story because everything goes terribly wrong. In fact, one of the main characters ends up dead. There are very deep religious undertones to this tale, and I'll give you an example. The boys are trying to determine what exactly the scary beast living in the forest must be like. So now we hear from Ralph, one of the boys who emerges as a leader. See if this sounds religious. He stopped again. The careful plan of this assembly had broken down. 
What do you want me to say then? I was wrong to call this assembly so late. We'll have to vote on them, on ghosts, I mean, and then go to the shelters because we're all tired. No. Jack, is it? Wait a minute. I'll say here and now that I don't believe in ghosts, or I don't think I do, but I don't like the thought of them, not now that is, in the dark, but we were going to decide what's what. Golding is using a microcosm of humanity, a group of young boys, to show us what he thinks human beings are like. It's a powerful illustration of our inherent need to find order, our need to explain and then deal with chaos, and of course our repeated failure to find any absolute security. These boys are absolutely convinced something on the island is wrong. There's a beast in the forest that needs to be dispatched. And so they expend a lot of energy trying to figure out how they're going to accomplish that. But of course, the idea that you can just take a vote to figure out what's true or what you should do about it, it's not entirely comforting because civilization has been doing that for thousands of years now, and that process has led to some pretty tragic results. Over the course of the last 2,000 years, a lot of church councils have made some rather bad decisions about what truth is by putting the matter to a vote. And making truth subservient to popular opinion has created a long legacy of embarrassment, from the pogroms launched against the Jews in Spain to the hunting of Waldensians and Albigenses during the Middle Ages. We have managed to convince ourselves that many minds make for better decisions because sometimes that's true. And the Bible actually supports that. Without counsel, it says, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So in other words, there is safety to be found when you consider everybody's perspective. But still, you're not guaranteed to find truth by collecting opinions. I guess what I really appreciate about Mr. Golding is the way he illustrates the fact that even our best thinking, our best efforts, seem to be flawed. And the human race seems to have this talent for making bad things worse all the time. Even now, at the height of technological achievement and scientific enlightenment, sometimes all of our accomplishments only serve to magnify our flaws instead of mitigate them. So that's where the Bible's perspective becomes quite helpful. Most of the world's religions have the human race trying to find their way back to whatever it is that we lost by paying attention to karma or by accumulating a bunch of good deeds or by turning inward in an effort to shed the illusion of life and achieve some kind of higher understanding. Most of our efforts are rooted in the idea that we need to better ourselves. But we have consistently, consistently failed to do that. Like you find in a Greek tragedy, we often contribute to our own downfall in the process of trying to avoid it. So, from that perspective, almost every history book I've read becomes a catalog of religious beliefs. They show me a long record of bad results, unintended consequences, where our very best efforts to improve this world never seem to fix it. But in the Bible, we have a unique perspective that makes a lot of sense, like you find in this passage in the book of Isaiah, where it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The Christian faith gives an honest assessment of the problem. It admits that something is wrong and that you are powerless to fix it. There is no working your way back to paradise because the essential flaw in the human race is anything but superficial. It's not like we have a broken leg and we can just patch it with a splint made from sticks and then hobble our way back to civilization. It's far more serious than that. It's more like your limbs have been amputated. So what we have in the pages of the Bible is a different kind of religion. A faith where the supreme being recognizes our tragic shortcomings and then he makes a move in our direction because he knows it doesn't work the other way. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. 
In the book of Jeremiah, there's a famous description of human nature and it reads like this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. In other words, our essential flaw is not just a matter of making some mistakes, like an accountant accidentally putting a number in the wrong column. Our problem is far more baked in. It's an actual flaw in our makeup. My fallen nature is every bit as much a part of me as the color of my skin or the size of my feet. It's something I was born into. What it means is that my best attempts to correct my flaws are going to be defective because we're talking about a systemic problem. From the biblical perspective, sin is not just a matter of doing some bad things. It's what we are when we're alienated from God. And so what we find in the Bible is God himself becoming one of us, a real flesh and blood human being. And as an actual human being, he lived the only perfect human life on record, which means that he is the only perfect example of what it means to be made in the image of God. And then at the peak of that experience, we crucified him, which only proved how broken we are. I mean, we were able to murder the very person who created us. There's a statement in the book of Romans, it's one of my absolute favorites, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Of all the religious documents I've ever read, the Bible stands alone. It's the only one that openly admits that our personal religious experiments are never going to work. And the only solution, the only possible solution, is a loving God who takes over on our behalf. Now, if you find yourself wondering who this God is, if you really don't know where to start in studying this book, to find out for yourself for once, to see what it says, let me help you. Go to BibleStudies.com. That's a website run by the good people who sponsor Authentic, the voice of prophecy. And there you'll find a number of Bible courses that are absolutely free to you. You can go through the Bible theme by theme. I know a lot of people start reading this book and they give up somewhere around Leviticus and Numbers. We can help you another way. We can help you read it theme by theme so that you understand all the major themes in the Bible for yourself. And if you have questions, you can ask. There's no obligation. It's absolutely free to you. Head on over to BibleStudies.com. I can't wait to meet you there. Thanks for joining me again this week. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching another episode of Authentic. You want to help more people see Authentic for free? Like, comment, and subscribe, and share this episode. That tells the algorithm you really like the show, which in turn recommends Authentic to a lot more people. Thanks for your support.